Good morning, everyone. I'm Tamiko Brown Nagan, Dean of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you all. Delighted to welcome you all to our Radcliffe Day 2022 celebration. Yes. And I'm especially thrilled to be back in the yard with all of you after two years of virtual festivities and with a fantastic audience, both in person and online. At its core, the Radcliffe Institute, with its proud history as Radcliffe College and its longstanding commitment to women and the study of gender, is all about our vibrant and broad community, one that includes students, scholars, artists, and practitioners who are grappling with questions that demand cross-disciplinary insight. And exciting, it's exciting to bring our community back together for this, the most important day of the year at Radcliffe. Today, we are here to honor the civil rights lawyer, scholar, and educator, Sherilyn Eiffel, for her tireless commitment to securing equal citizenship rights for all Americans. Her work, I believe, embodies Radcliffe's highest ideals. Later today, Sherilyn will engage in a keynote conversation with my distinguished colleague at Harvard Law School and 300th anniversary university professor, Martha Minow. I'll introduce them both more fully this afternoon, and we'll also hear recorded remarks from Brian Stevenson and a testimonial from Rachel Maddow. <laughs> As is our tradition, we'll start our day with a panel discussion. Each year, we focus on an issue that resonates with our honorees, life, and work. And today, our panelists will explore how our education access equity, and the American workforce. As an educator, Sherilyn has taught and mentored future civil rights advocates. And as a lawyer, she's fought for equitable access to education. The NAACP Legal and Educational Fund, which Sherilyn led for nearly 10 years, of course litigated the landmark 1954 case, Brown versus Board of Education in which the U.S. Supreme Court held that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. In that decision, Chief Justice Earl Warren called education perhaps the most important function of state and local governments and observed that in these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. As President and Director Counsel, Cheryl Lind reaffirmed LDF's commitment to equal access to quality public education and to affordable higher education because, she said, education is vital to dem democratic citizenship and it is a conduit to opportunity. Indeed, education's importance has only grown as the U.S. economy has shifted away from manufacturing and towards service-providing industries. In this environment, post-secondary education has become increasingly important for securing well-paying jobs, and higher levels of education are strongly associated with greater income and wealth. A Federal Reserve analysis found that in 2019, Families headed by someone with a college degree had over twice the average income and four times the average net worth of other families. People with more education also generally have lower unemployment rates and even better health outcomes. Yet access to education and to the opportunity that it creates remains unequal. Structural, economic, and racial inequities drive education disparities long before students reach the post-secondary level. 
Poverty negatively impacts children's academic outcomes from an early age. Students living in impoverished neighborhoods face additional stressors, as well as environmental exposures. They also attend lower quality schools. These effects are amplified across lines of race and ethnicity. A 2018 analysis by the Government Accountability Office found that black and Hispanic students comprised about 80% of students enrolled at public high schools with the highest concentration of poverty. The same analysis found that higher poverty schools were less likely to offer the advanced math and science courses prized in college admissions. And speaking of admissions, for those students who pursue four-year college degrees, the necessity of navigating complicated and often opaque policies and procedures present yet more obstacles. This challenge is particularly acute for students from under-resourced schools and who are the first in their families to pursue college. Tuition, fees, and commuting costs and logistics create more barriers and rising costs have often outpaced financial assistance. On campus, inequities persist. Once students are on the path to a degree, finances or life circumstances often face them to take a semester off, transfer schools, or withdraw entirely. We know that mentoring confers critical benefits for successfully navigating school and later employment Yet women, first-generation and underrepresented students of color also face a mentoring gap on campus. Internships are another key to post-graduation outcomes, but lack of knowledge about how to secure them, outside obligations, as well as financial constraints, all hinder participation for first-generation and low-income students. These disparities, of course, are long-standing, but many were brought into sharp relief by COVID-19 as students at residential colleges returned home and attempted to continue their studies under wildly different circumstances. The result of all these and many other intersecting factors is predictable. In short, inequitable access to education perpetuates inequality over the course of lifetimes, and in fact, across generations. A child's life chances are shaped by access to quality education, and that access often depends on a lottery at birth of geography and social economic status. Few have shown this as clearly as our panel moderator, Raj Chetty. Raj, and today's, yes. <laughs> Raj and today's other distinguished panelists will grapple with the critical question of how to build an accessible and an equitable higher education system that enables students from all backgrounds, interests, and abilities to secure stable livelihoods in our changing workforce. Raj is the William A. Ackman Professor of Public Economics here at Harvard and the Director of Opportunity Insights which uses big data to explore how to give children from disadvantaged backgrounds better chances of succeeding. Raj's widely cited scholarship uses empirical evidence and economic theory to enable more effective government policy. His many awards include a MacArthur Fellowship and the John Bates Clark Medal. Raj will introduce our panelists in just a moment, so let me say how grateful I am to Raj and to all of the panelists for being here. And now, please join me in giving them a warm welcome as they enter the stage.
Thanks so much, Tamika, for the very warm introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'll introduce my distinguished uh, fellow panelists in a moment. But let me just start by saying it's, a, it's really a pleasure to welcome all of you to Radcliffe Day to honor Sherilyn Eiffel for her path-breaking contributions in making our country a more just and equitable society, and to moderate this panel on the role of higher education in helping us achieve those goals. <clears throat> For me, the topic of this panel is of deep personal significance and interest because I see it as central to why I am here uh, today. Let me explain by sharing a bit of my own personal story. My mother grew up in a small town in South India in a time where it was unheard of for women to go to college. By a stroke of luck, it turned out that a wealthy philanthropist decided to open a small college for women in her hometown the year she was finishing high school. Her father, my grandfather, a freedom fighter in India, uh, believed strongly in women's rights and supported her attendance at this new college. She went on to become the first female doctor in our community and is currently a physician researcher here at Tufts Medical School. I'm certain... <laughs> and turns out my mom's actually in attendance here in the audience ah. today, so it's great. <laughs> I'm certain I wouldn't be here in the United States, let alone on this stage here at Harvard, had that college in her town opened a year later. Inspired by my personal experience, my own research as a professor of economics here at Harvard is focused on the determinants of upward mobility, the science of economic opportunity, if you will. In our research group, Opportunity Insights, we use the tools of big data to study not one experience, but millions of such experiences to figure out where students thrive and understand how we can expand pathways to opportunity for more kids in America and beyond. In one study, we use data on 30 million children and their parents, which we draw from anonymized tax returns and Department of Education records, to construct measures of economic mobility for every college in America. Essentially, we use these data to ask, how much is Harvard and every other college in America helping children rise up? We find that while higher education can be a great leveler and pathway to upward mobility, there's no guarantee that it functions in this way. If children from wealthy families attend the colleges that provide the best pathways to good jobs and higher incomes, while kids from lower income families attend colleges that don't have the resources and supports to propel them to success, then the higher education system might actually reduce social mobility and exacerbate inequality as uh, Tamika was mentioning in her introduction. Unfortunately, the data suggests that this is the world we actually live in today in America. Kids from families in the top 1% of the income distribution, earning more than about $600,000 a year, are about 60 times as likely to attend Harvard as kids from low-income families. And that's despite the enormous strides that have been made at Harvard and other leading institutions to expand financial aid and reach more low-income students in recent years. Conversely, at the institutions that serve large numbers of low-income students, often community colleges, we see that many students struggle to graduate and despite their efforts, often end up with relatively low wages and substantial debt. So given this picture, I think a central question for the United States to remain a land of opportunity, the one that we'll grapple with today, is how we can create a system of higher education that works to expand social mobility. How do we increase access for low-income students to our nation's best colleges? And how do we improve outcomes at institutions that currently serve many low-income students? To address these issues, we have an incredible group of people who are making a difference on the ground and in shaping the national conversation on precisely those questions. Donna Shalala, who has held a multitude of roles in public service, Don is, in addition to having held a multitude of roles in public service, has also been the president of three universities and is a Radcliffe medalist herself. So I'm delighted to have you here. <laughs> Leslie Cornfield, who's developing innovative programs to bring instruction from top tier colleges into under resourced high schools. Delighted to have you. Pam Edinger, who served in her role as president of Massachusetts' largest community college, Bunker Hill Community College, right here in Boston, for nearly a decade. <laughs> Ann 
and Tony Carnival, who unfortunately wasn't able to make it in person, but is right here with us, thanks to the wonders of technology. Um, Tony is the director of Georgetown's Center on Education and the Workforce and has contributed critically to our understanding of the relationship between higher education and equity. So let me start with you, Donna, and ask you to draw from your experience as leading three very different institutions, UW-Madison, Hunter College at CUNY, and most recently the University of Miami, to share what you've learned about what works in helping students succeed, especially students from lower income backgrounds, first generation students. Well, the most critical element, Raj, um, uh, has been understanding students' lives and understanding uh, the population that you're trying to serve and you're trying to target. And that means that um, the traditional way that colleges support students are, are too cookie cutter and you have to have targeted ways of both recruiting and retaining students. And let me give you a small example from UW-Madison. We wanted to recruit, and we did successfully recruit, a large number of Native American students. Wisconsin has a number of um, Native American uh, tribes. But when they came, we realized that while they were prepared for college, our retention was lousy and they weren't using the services that were available because in their culture, they did not ask for help. All right. We overcame that by actually hiring Native American counselors who interacted with the students and that became particularly important. At, at Miami, we discovered that uh, freshmen did not ask their advisors for help because they were just afraid of these big professors that they were assigned to. So we recruited recent graduates, put them in the freshman dorms, had them work from 6 p.m. until 11 to answer questions and to refer them to services when they needed services. But it was understanding the populations. Ethnic pop populations are different from other populations. All of us will talk about wraparound services for retention and all the other tutoring and other things, but you have to get students to that and you have to understand their lives and their backgrounds to make a difference. So understanding your students, that makes a lot of sense. So Pam, let me go over to you. You're doing that every day at Bunker Hill Community College. Can you share with us? We, we channel Dr. Shalila every day. <laughs> <laughs> It, it is really important to have those guiding principles for us. Um, our students, let's say our community college system and our four-year systems are not shaped for the students who are in them now. They're shaped for students of four, you know, 25, 30 years ago. So our students are, um, only a third of them are traditional age, and the rest of them are um, what we call post-traditional, and they're adults. Three out of four work, most of them full-time and three out of five are parents, and half of those parents are um, single moms. And we use Raj's data, actually, sometime to define our students. Three quarters of them, 77%, are living in the two lowest quintile of income. But when they credential with us, either with a certificate or an associate degree, their income flip up to quintile. Raj says so, and we looked at his data, and he is right. <laughs> versus, let's say, um, students from selective colleges, 77% of those students are in a top two quintile of income. Now, they will become the leaders of society and define a lot of our fields. But remember, I've got 50% of the undergraduates across the United States. They are our future workforce. And um, so my students are a quarter white, quarter black, quarter Latinx, 15% Asian, Asian Pacific Islander and in 10% a mixture of everything else. If they're going into a system that's not built for them, that has four-year metrics and measures, and you say, go ahead, you can succeed, here's an opportunity. Well, the opportunity does not finish itself until they graduate, or they get a job that can support their family. So we do a lot of work around the idea of affinity. Um, we have a program that's targeted to black and brown men who has the, a huge attainment gap in our system. So we hire students, just like Dr. Shalala says, um, who are graduates, who are black and brown, who are men, 
and they carry our students throughout the year, and then they have peer mentors who's a step ahead. What I'm really hoping is that, you know, I'm looking at Leslie now, um, at some point in time, we would have successful students of color from places like Harvard to come to community college to show our students that there is a pathway, deep pathway. Um, so all of us who are at the head of community colleges are servant leaders. Um, my background is very similar to, to Roger's, except I'm that first person to, to, to be in higher education. Um, so we, some, my, my parents, um, my dad was a waiter, is a waiter, well, was a waiter, he retired, and my mom did Garmin work. Um, and she brought Garmin work home so she could be with the children after school. They are the generation that gave, and I'm the generation that received. So I hope to be of service. Leslie, let me ask you, you know, you're not directly working in, the, in an institution like Bunker Hill, but you're working with many students who are on that journey, and so I'd be interested in your perspective on, on what we can do. Well, first of all, I think that it's clear that no one climbs Everest alone. And I think that that's nowhere more clear than in the students that we're all talking about. Students that come from low-income backgrounds, from incomes of poverty, from low-performing schools across the country, and from segregated silo experiences. And so I think that often for them, when they look at the idea of succeeding in college, it's tantamount to them to climbing Everest. And like those that climb Everest, we've got people that are supporting them along the way at every step, like both of my colleagues here have said. And I think it's critical that we organize for success that way, um, that we organize for support in our institutions of higher education, starting with that very first year, learning what we did in the high school space to increase graduation rates, focusing on ninth grade success, I think it's critical that we focus those supports um, on that first year where we know that uh, the, the exit rates are highest. But the second thing is, I think we have to stop thinking about K through 12 and higher ed as two completely different silos in this country. And I think that higher education has a responsibility and an opportunity to help both advance college readiness throughout our country, particularly in these communities, and to help students identify um, that talent for admissions offices and themselves. And so I think that until we separate those silos in this country, there's, and there's tremendous opportunity when we do that. That makes a lot of sense. In so some of the themes I'm hearing here, you know, what's very interesting is often the public discussion of these issues is focused on resources and incentives and financing and so forth. But what I think everyone's emphasized so far is the importance of support, having the right mentors. You know, you're at the same institution, but you're from a community that, that isn't as supported, and it's very critical to, to have the right group of people around to, to guide you through. And that's a theme I, I want to come back to. But let me bring you in here, Tony. You've been studying these issues for many years. We've looked at, learned a lot from your studies. And I'd be interested in your perspective from looking at the data and what you see as the key challenges. How do we help kids from disadvantaged backgrounds succeed uh, in, in higher education? Well, first, let me uh, say I'm grateful to be here uh, celebrating Cheryl and Eiffel, who's been one of my heroes for decades. Uh, and. Um, it's also a privilege in general, I must say, today um, to be celebrating good works and excellence in the midst of all this cruelty uh, at home and abroad. Um, but my bias about this is not very positive in the sense that it seems to me quite clear, and Raj's work proves this, uh, that in the end, the American education system on the whole, and it is all one system, the American education system has become the biggest gear wheel in the American uh, 
inequality machine and the American uh, and the American failure to realize racial class and gender justice. So the education system is the primary barrier uh, to that realization, especially when you connect it to labor markets. And in my my bias again is that when we talk about upward mobility in America, we're talking about money in the end, or at least that's the only legitimate thing we can talk about that uh, uh, in the end uh, is subject to government policy uh, or community action. So I think the, uh, the truth of the matter is that since the 80s, access to post-secondary education and training and increasingly training um, has been the most traveled pathway to the middle class. And uh, it has, in the end, um, as Rogers' data shows and ours and many other people, its effect has not been to create upper mobility. It's quite the opposite. That is, it increasingly promotes um, the maintenance of an American elite that is primarily white, um, and the education system, the capstone in that system is the elite colleges, uh, notwithstanding Bunker Hill, in this room. So, you know, I think uh, you need to hear that. Um, I don't see any hope for progress here. The, uh, the shift uh, is persistently towards more and more privilege uh, moving through higher education and on jobs. And that is, as somebody else was saying, uh, K-12 system is implicated in this. That is, uh, while there are lots of efforts to break down the barriers between high school, college, and careers, all of that advantage is accruing to kids who are already advantaged. It's not really happening for low-income kids, minorities, and there is another whole set of problems with uh, gender. Uh, so the, uh, I don't, bring good news, and I'm sorry for that. I don't like to be that skunk at the picnic, but uh, if you're going to have outdoor meetings, you're going to get skunks. <laughs> so, you know, I think um, uh, in the end, what we see coming some is good and bad news. That is, there is a about to be a shift towards training in federal policy and federal support for post-secondary training. The um, uh, the Infrastructure Act will reinforce that. That is, every politician in Massachusetts and in every other state and county exec and mayor and so on, they're all going to be cutting ribbons. And some genius, some staff genius figured out that if you want to have 12 people cut the ribbon, just get a longer ribbon and more scissors. It was a real innovation over my time when I used to be involved in those things. Um, but there's going to be a lot of ribbon cutting. And at those ribbon cutting ceremonies, uh, there's going to always be a reporter of some kind. And they're always going to ask, uh, does this mean these infrastructure jobs, which are, are mostly for high school graduate males, uh, is that going to, uh, does that mean you don't really need a BA anymore? And the politicians will all say, yes, that's what it means. That's what they're all saying, including, including the Biden administration. So there is a, um, uh, and the shift towards training and funding will do similar things. Now that's all good. If training gets somebody a good job, that's a good thing, but it will increase the segregation in the American education system, race, class, and gender segregation, um, especially uh, in the post-secondary system, which is already highly segregated uh, by race, class, and gender in terms of curriculums. So. I think the, uh, and then on top of that, we have a demographic shift coming in which, let's say 2025, after that, we're going to get a somewhat dramatic decline in college age students. So uh, a lot of colleges are going to be chasing people and not finding enough people to chase uh, to balance their budgets. And I think uh, what will happen as a result of that uh, at the same time, we're getting fewer and fewer kids in the college age population. And at the same time, more and more of those kids come from two BA families uh, and, the, and have the money that goes with a two BA family, which means 
they'll chase selectivity. So selective institutions are going to be fine. Um, in many cases, applications are doubling every year now. So I think the, uh, the basic uh, inequality in the American education system is going to get more severe. I don't see how there's any other outcome moving forward. And I think that's a major question. I think there's only so much selective colleges can do about this. I think in the end, the real issue here is the business model in higher education, which for a place like Harvard uh, is about prestige, not about money. They've got more money than God. Uh, so the uh, in the end, it's chasing prestige, uh, whether it's test scores or uh, class rank or whatever. It's the same game. So and in the end, uh, for other colleges that aren't rich, uh, it's necessary for many private colleges, especially, uh, either you climb or you die uh, going forward. That is the, uh, the, the decline in students, especially going south and west, uh, will force those institutions to chase selectivity. They won't all make it. Um, so I think the only real hope in this is the public system and the best hope is that we are, in fact, attaching labor market outcomes to higher education at the program level. Institutions matter less and less. Uh, program matters more and more. That's what the data says. So it's what you take determines what you make more than where you go. So there is a shift here that's ongoing. We now have the data, people like me and Raj, uh, we can tell you in any college in America, in any program in those colleges, uh, the extent to which if you take that program, you will be with the extent to which the probability of your being employed compared to all the people who took the program before you uh, and your pr projected earnings uh, out over 20 years now. So we know all that. Nobody's telling the students. People like Raj and I know, but nobody else does. I know what the most lucrative major is at Georgetown, and it ain't classics. So, you know, I think the, uh, but nobody at Georgetown is interested in that or cares or wants that known. So the higher education community will resist its connection to uh, employment, which is ultimately the only source of upward mobility in the American system. So I think that, uh, what we're talking about here today are some heroes in this business, which are people who actually care about this and work with students who need their help. But I think in general, the systemic reality is pretty dour. Well, Tony offers a very sobering perspective. Um, <laughs> but, but I think it's important to acknowledge, and I agree you know, largely in terms of what we see in the data, that is kind of where we are. My, my perspective and my hope for this panel is, you know, as I look around who's on this panel, look at who's in the audience, it's precisely the folks we have, you know, here today who can potentially change that trajectory as inevitable as it might seem. I think this is not something that just happens automatically. It's a consequences of decisions that are made at an institutional level, at a policy level. And so in that vein, I want to come back to you, Donna. You know, you talked a bit about your experiences at Madison. Earlier, we were talking about your experiences at Hunter College, a very different institution, where I think you do see some positive signs. And so what would be your counter argument, if you will, to Tony, or how can we move things forward as, as productively as possible? Well, um, you can't argue with Tony about what the data uh, says. The, the question is whether the elite colleges produce um, elite graduates because of the colleges themselves or because they're connected because of their families? Um, is it the colleges that uh, make the difference? It's the network that you get into when you get um, uh, into these colleges. One of the things that I find terribly offensive, and I spent a couple of years in Congress, is the people that are making the policies to shift students, particularly low-income students, to training programs have liberal arts degrees themselves. The policymakers would never put their children 
in, in those situations, as opposed to giving them extraordinary opportunities to go to elite colleges. So I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. But here's where I agree with Tony. It's not just the higher education system. It's the work situation that they go into and how those corporations view the degrees that they get. Mm -hmm. There's no question in my mind, after being at two great public institutions and a private one that's very diverse, that our students are as bright as anyone in the elite colleges. Mm -hmm. We've known that for a long time because the elite colleges kept Jews out and African Americans and, and brown people uh, for so long. So we got our Nobel laureates out of Hunter and City College um, and, and other great public um, institutions. So our job is to make sure that the entire university systems, the community colleges right through graduate education is open to everyone mm -hmm. that has the ability. I mean, there's no uh, question about that, that we don't look at color or anything else, that we make them open to everyone. And we support them in the process. Listen, we do it, we do it better for uh, Division I college at athletes. In this country, the great universities that have Division I college athletes, and I'm not talking about the elite, the short elite list, they graduate those students at the same rate as the general student body. And why is that? Because they have support services all over them. If we had those kinds of support services, as sensitive as they are for every student that came into our colleges, we'd have a difference in outcomes. Yeah. Do you want to add uh, there, Leslie? So one theme that, that came up is, the, and you mentioned this earlier, is the idea that elite colleges can think about going beyond what's happening on campus to what's happening in the K through 12 system as a way to address some of the challenges that, that Tony is describing. So can you say a bit more about what exactly you meant there? Yes. Um, so the my background is in civil rights, and as a former federal civil rights prosecutor, I've come to believe that education is the civil rights issue of our time. And Tony, I'm going to push back a little bit on some of the things you said. I agree with most of it. But I do think that we're seeing some bright spots, some scalable bright spots that suggest that we can move the needle in some of the mobility areas. So, um, and, and Raj, I have to say that your data on the power of intergenerational mobility really inspired the work that, that I'm leading now with many people in this room at the National Education Equity Lab. Um, and it shaped our thinking when I was in the Obama administration because we would visit colleges uh, we would visit high schools and we would uh, meet with the top students in those high schools and the principals and we would hear that even the most talented, brightest students from these high schools in the most underserved communities did not believe that they were college worthy and didn't have a way to demonstrate their talents to admissions offices, right? Because we know that GPAs from unknown schools in Flint and Gallup, New Mexico, and many of the other communities that we're in now don't carry much weight. On the other side of that, we would meet with admissions offices and leadership at uh, higher education top universities, and they would say, we can't find the talent in these communities. Donna, to your point, we know that admissions offices can fly into these communities and find the best athletes, but we want to, and it's critical that we now help them identify the best scholars in these very same communities as well. And so, so the model that the National Education Equity Lab is developing is a model where we, we step back the, the, the founders of this and asked ourselves, what would happen if we brought the most elite universities in our country into the most underserved high schools in our country? What if we brought college credit-bearing courses from these top universities? And that's what we did. So that's, we have a model where we bring college credit-bearing courses from top colleges into 
Title I underserved high schools at scale at no cost to students. We started in 2019 with a uh, 25 schools, a single course by Harvard professor Lisa New, a humanities course. We got proof of concept. Over 80% of the students passed that class. Fast forward, we are now uh, offering classes from over a dozen universities um, in uh, 200 high schools, 32 states, and we will have reached 10,000 students by the end of this year. And the colleges that are participating, I just want to flag them because they're truly pioneers. Princeton, Howard, Stanford, Wharton, Cornell, Spelman, Barnard, ASU, Georgetown, Brown, Wesleyan University, the president himself, Michael Roth, rolled up his sleeves and taught a credit-bearing course in high schools across the country himself. And I think that there's an opportunity. We're seeing that these students, the pass rate is over 80%. Over 80% of these students are getting transcripts from these universities. Um, many of these schools now are offering multiple colleges in their, in, their, uh, in their high schools. And I think that the evidence on this is also quite robust. We, this model isn't new. What's new is the ability to scale it by using asynchronous courses and some existing resources. But, but the evidence base around the power of early college in these high schools on access, on admission, and most important, perhaps, persistence is overwhelmingly positive. And so I think that there is tremendous hope that we have. Uh, we've seen it from students. We've got a young woman right now from Navajo Nation who got an A in that humanities course, and her brother said to her, why don't you apply off reservation? No one she knew had ever gone off out of their zip code. She got a full scholarship at Columbia and is doing a fantastic job. And now all of the students, including Georgetown, Tony, are inviting these scholars that are doing particularly well in these courses to come to their universities. Because what better way to see if a student is college ready than to see how they did in an actual college class as graded by teaching fellows from those universities. So I am hopeful, given the moment that we're in in our country, that we can create a new pipeline from these communities into well-matched schools for students across the country. Great. That's great. Well, if I may, let me just say a couple of things, because I agree with everything that's being said here. It's just that I just don't think it's going to work. Um, in the end, um, the class, race, and gender differences persist in an increase in the data. They're not getting smaller uh, in spite of all the efforts. And that the, uh, in the end, uh, I think that the answer is, and I don't think it's had much to do with private colleges, it has to do with public colleges. Uh, I think the answer is that uh, in the end, we need to tie uh, college at the program level to the labor market. We need transparency on degrees. No one should tell somebody they can't major in archaeology or Shakespeare. Uh, so, but we need to be, we need to tell them that if you major in those subjects, here's what happened to everybody else at your institution that did that. And here, by the way, is if you go onto the school down the road, it might, you might be better off in this program, in their program. But the, which is something that colleges just can't do. You can't expect anybody to sell stuff that isn't already on the shelf in any business. So I think the, um, the hope here is that we get stronger connections at the program level in public colleges um, to labor market outcomes. I, you know, because in the end, it's about money. I mean, the, the purpose of higher education is and always has been human flourishing since capitalism ran into democracy a few centuries ago. That's been, education has been part of the, uh, the contract, social contract uh, that mediates between the two. And the purpose of education is to allow people to live more fully in their time or to flourish or whatever words you want to use. But you can't flourish or live more fully in your time if you can't get a job uh, and you're living under a bridge. So 
there is a an economic dimension to this, which has arrived. It's nobody's fault. The economy did it. That now, uh, since the 80s, since 83, uh, we see the connection between education and uh, employment and earnings has become much more powerful and much more powerful at the program level. That's the new reality. I think you can reorganize public systems in recognition of that, and you might even be able to break the cost curve. Because one thing that happens in any economic system or in any endeavor in modern uh, societies is that if you have something that's valuable, and clearly education is enormously valuable now, if you have something that's valuable, the way you make it more efficient is you break the, va the value into its component elements. Uh, that's how business people behave. Uh, you find what's making money and you go for it. So in the end, the, uh, I think that rationalizing the public system based on labor market outcomes, transparency, not uh, accountability, accountability for training. We're arriving at a compromise on that, which is we're going to do a lot more training, uh, but in all cases, it either has to meet a 20% value added standard or a minimum wage, or a minimum annual earnings of 25 grand. That is finally being resolved. So we're gonna discipline training. We're not gonna discipline, I think, we're not gonna discipline degrees. Uh, people, if you're a politician and you stand in front of an audience uh, and you say you're gonna do all this stuff with earnings returns and employment, someone's gonna raise their hand and say, does that mean I can't major in archeology? span The obvious answer is no, it doesn't mean that. We only want transparency for you. Uh, but for less advantaged kids, we want more of that, and uh, we want to tie these systems that is high school, college, and careers, in my view, and that's happening all over the country, from linked learning in California to there are about 12 of those apprenticeship in Denver, um, all of which presumes post-secondary education. So I think... Uh, there are about 12 of these uh, examples of this attempt to tie... Uh, high school, college, and careers to labor markets, and I think they'll continue to grow. One problem are, is the employers. I mean, it has been, for all of you who do this work, I'm, I don't think my experience is unusual. That is, employer involvement is like love. Uh, everybody wants it, but there's never enough to go around. And employers are fickle. Uh, and in the American system, employers don't take responsibility for training up or giving internships or work-based learning uh, to people they're not going to hire. So there is a, uh, this is a public issue. We're not going to, the employer involvement is a piece of that and everybody chases it, but there's not enough to go around. So it's going to have to be done uh, in the public system. So Donna, you whispered in my ear as, as Tony was yeah, talking, I, I disagree. So I, did. Tell us why you disagree. I think we have to be very careful about this argument. Um, particularly if it, what it does is channel low-income kids into training programs, which may turn out to be out of date and their second or third job um, requires additional uh, education. I also don't know how, I also don't know, I have asked every CEO I've run into, Tony, what they majored in. They all majored in liberal arts. They all have arts and sciences uh, degrees. Uh, one had an engineering degree, I remember. Uh, um, Jeff Immelt, at, uh, who uh, ran General Electric, he had an engineering degree. But he took a lot of liberal arts at Dartmouth at the, at the same time. So I'm, I'm a little careful. The other thing is, I don't know how we maintain classics departments or the 87 languages they teach at African languages they teach at the University uh, of Wisconsin. I don't know how we maintain those programs if we're so focused, and I believe in transparency, but what it's going to do is to tell lots of parents how much money the, the kids can make in their first job if they stay in that field, maybe over 20 years, but it won't give them the kind of flexibility to change jobs uh, to change professions, to absorb new technologies, or have the context that history uh, gives you. So I'm very worried about being too narrow 
and particularly for low-income students, but Pam, this is your world. And look, I went to a public high school. I went to a technical high school. I came from a working class background, exactly the kind of background we're talking about for these kids, in a diverse school in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, West Technical High School. Most of the kids in my uh, school did not go on to college. I, I am again channeling Dr. Shalala all day. It's kind of a shamanistic mysticism going on here. Um, I actually agree with a lot of what um, Tony has said. We do not, we know, we are good technicians. We know how to identify programs that are high paid with a lot of immediate satisfaction um, and get our students or graduates good wages. That's how we get to flip to quintile in the income bracket one state credential. And it's, it's important and we know absolutely um, what fields those are, particularly in, in Northeast and New England. So if we were to follow that model, you would only get lots of ally health workers in your hospitals, lots of IT programmers, some engineers. God forbid you're looking for teachers, early childhood workers, and anything that's in the human services field. I'll come find them. And yes, it is a choice. Yes, we do have transparency, but I think we have a deeper problem than that. We are going to have a population cliff. Nathan Grawl said it, Tony said it earlier. We're not, 18 years ago, nobody wanted to have babies. Now we have no graduates in high school. And we're going to have that problem 18 years from now because nobody's having babies during the pandemic. So our hope of keeping a vibrant workforce and having a, a source for that workforce is our gateway cities, is our communities of color and adults, who what we call our opportunity youth, they're out of school, they're out of college, they're working on low wage jobs. It's the retraining of this group that's gonna make our workforce vibrant to serve all of these corporations and large institutions of healthcare. Though nobody's gonna look for, after their children. But I think ultimately, the issue is not creating a second class citizens of workers. But also two other things. Leslie talked about bringing transfers into elite institutions, yet we cannot reconcile our traditional idea of meritocracy, which we identify with either those folks who are poor like I was, getting into an Ivy League college or some selective college and therefore we, we have merit versus inclusive excellence, which we love to say, but we don't do, right? I cannot imagine that there's only half a percentage point or one third of a percentage point of high performing students in the 50% of undergraduates that I have in the community colleges, those are the only people who are worthy of transfer into selective colleges. I refuse to believe that that there's only two people in 16,000 students that I have at a community college who can hack it at MIT or hack it at Harvard or anywhere else, my home college of Barnard and Columbia. I refuse to believe that. So there's something wrong with that. So yes, it is a question of program selection, it's a question of money, but it's also a question of are our public intellectuals telling these real stories about what we're doing with a fight between meritocracy and really our own cowardice, cowardice in admitting that inclusive excellence is not being done, right? however we say it. And the second part of this, it's really about the quality of jobs. Right? We have refused to acknowledge that the people who teach our children, take care of our children, who are in public service, are worthy, as worthy as engineers. And whose responsibility is that? And I would say to you, it is the responsibilities of public intellectuals, the best of our selective colleges. I refuse to say elite, because that would insult every single one of my students. The selective colleges, because of our leadership in these policy areas, has the responsibility to lift the essential jobs in our nation so that they are paid more than $15 an hour.
And unless we solve those problems in, in, in the state level, at the federal level, we will continue to have economic injustice. We will continue to have economic policies. That is a shame for our nation. And we will continue to have that wealth gap where a black person's average asset is $8 versus most of us in the audience whose net assets is above a quarter million dollars. That is not okay. So yes, I absolutely agree with Tony. We have to get an immediate solution to get people jobs that pays a living wage. But we also have to, as folks who are gathered here today, who believe that we're leaders of our society, to tackle the basic root causes of economic injustice. It is our value system and the narratives that we tell ourselves. So big job, soft poverty, that's the X. I, mean, I don't mean yeah. to say that there's not good yeah, stuff going yeah. on. There is. I think this attempt to link high school, college, and careers as a general matter is proceeding and is inevitable. The real issue is transparency versus accountability. I think that'll be resolved in favor of four-year colleges and BAs, and should be. Um, in the end, uh, one of the things I see that I particularly like at the moment is the community college BA. Now, there's less and less chance of that happening the closer you get to Boston, by the way. That is, this is something that's happening in the South and the West, not in New England. <laughs> New England is not conservative necessarily, but it's very traditional. Give it so time, I end, we're coming. <laughs> Four-year colleges are an industry in New England. I used to be work for the New England delegation we didn't like community colleges and we didn't like vocational education. So in the end, um, I think that we're moving in this direction. I think it's somewhat inevitable. The question is, you know, for instance, we don't have a career counseling system in America. I mean, nobody tells the kid uh, who's applying for college or I think you have to tell them in high school, although that's too soon, I understand that, um, but uh, you can't trust colleges to tell people this because they'll be running against themselves. So I, you know, I, we need a career counseling system so that people actually know uh, what is likely to happen to them if they pursue a particular education path. And we are, we are simply bereft of a career count. It, it doesn't exist. Yeah, Leslie, you're going to jump in. Two quick things. I want to agree with something that you've just that you said. I think that when we talk about is college for everyone, right? So that's really the question that we're asking. And I think that that is the wrong question and a dangerous question because what we're really asking is college for everyone without means. Because we know that families with means are going to do everything possible to get their students, to get their children into four or two year colleges. So I just think that we have to look at this through an equity lens, even in the framing of the question. Um, the second point is that we're talking around this, but I think we have to also address the toxic impact of low expectations in this country for students that are in these communities. So in one of our high schools in McKinley, uh, McKinley High School in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, first of all, I will share that when we told the state that we were in that high school, uh, one of the people in the room literally laughed that this high school, it's a predominantly black, historically black high school, would even could ever succeed. And one of the young women who spoke recently with us at South by Southwest said to the audience, when you go to McKinley High School, most of us learn come to believe that we are more likely to go to prison than to college. And she said, do you know what it means to have Wharton University in the house, Stanford University in our building? What that signals to us in terms of worthiness and that there are people in these communities outside that believe in us. So as we have these conversations, I just, want to really remind us of the importance of, of shifting those low expectations. Um, uh, you know, we've had teachers in our schools that have thanked us for enforcing deadlines in our college and high school courses. 
because no one even enforces deadlines in these schools. They're just happy if the paper is turned in. What happens to those students when they're freshmen at any university, right? And so uh, that, that's really the urging, that we, we, we say that we know that talent is evenly distributed and opportunity is not, but I think we just have to be committed to doing everything we can in trying to overcome that. I think that makes a lot of sense. So I want to take a minute here to just you know, contribute to this discussion by talking about what we're seeing in the latest research on a number of the themes that have come up, starting with whether we should, the solution really lies in public schools versus um, highly selective institutions. I appreciate uh, Pam you know, pointing out not using the term elite that's often used in this space, you know, highly selective institutions like Ivy League schools and other comparable institutions, what is the role they have to play versus public institutions at large, as, as Tony was saying? So, so the way I think about it is that by the numbers, public institutions are surely the, what's critical for economic mobility, right? So if you think about the highly selective institutions in the US, like Ivy League colleges, they educate less than half a percentage point of uh, the, the, the total population in the US. So just in terms of overall numbers, if you think about people rising from the bottom to the top, there's no possible way institutions like Harvard in and of themselves are going to change the overall numbers that much. However, if you look at what we think of as upper tail economic mobility, reaching positions of great influence in society, think about who becomes uh, leaders in government or uh, you know, leading scientists, lawyers, and so forth. If you look at the data, it's extremely clear that these universities, despite their very small size, play an incredibly outsized role in providing a pathway to those types of positions of influence. So just to give you one statistic that's in my mind, if you look at journalists, say, at leading newspapers like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, more than 25 or 30 percent of them have graduated from a small set of, you know, eight or 12 Ivy League and similar institutions, right? So despite having a tiny share of the population, in certain very influential positions, th these institutions are incredibly important. So why is that important to recognize? I think diversifying access to these institutions then becomes extremely important if they are providing a pathway to success. And to one of the points Donna raised, I, I think the data suggests it's not merely that the students who are getting into these places are talented and would have gotten to those positions regardless. Of course, they are very talented. They're getting through various hoops in the admissions process. But we see that kids who get in versus kids who narrowly don't, it really makes a quite significant difference. There's a big causal impact of getting into a place like Harvard that really opens doors and changes kids' trajectories in terms of, in particular, having an opportunity to reach that upper tail elite of US society that's very influential. And so my view of why we should be very interested in understanding access to higher education, even in that small set of schools, despite their small sizes, if we want to have a diverse, leader, diverse set of leaders in America, it's extremely important to understand what's happening uh, at these institutions. Now, more broadly, in terms of expanding economic mobility in general, of course, we have to understand how we support institutions that are educating many, many more students, community colleges, two-year institutions, and so forth, and how we uh, improve outcomes there are through a combination of funding, the, the support services that have been described, and so forth. Uh, another point I want to make, so Tony mentioned a number of times, and there's been some discussion about the importance of transparency and telling students that if you do this degree or attend that institution, you know, that may have an impact. And of course, having that data, which we now have, is incredibly valuable just to have facts. But I also think there's there have now been a series of studies that have shown that simply giving people information, like if I just send you a brochure in the mail and tell you, you know, here's what you make if you do X or Y at this college versus that college, that doesn't in and of itself have that much of an impact on what people actually end up choosing. What seems to matter much more, and this connects with the ideas again of providing support, of career counseling, and so forth, is when somebody actually takes that information and talks to you about it and provides kind of the, the kind of intuitively, if you think about it, you know, all of us can probably point to a teacher or someone who you know, played a great role in shaping where we are today. I think it's exactly that sort of thing. It's not literally about transparency. That can be a necessary condition, but I think you need to do more. There's good evidence of that to, to, to really have an impact. One a final point on the issue that's come up of training 
vocational training versus, say, a more liberal arts sort of education. So one study I find very uh, interesting in that context is by my colleague Dave Deming, who's a professor at the Kennedy School. And what he showed is if you look at who has really experienced significant increases in income over the past three decades or so in the US, a period of very rapidly rising inequality, you can break it down on two dimensions. Suppose you think about just technical aptitude, things like measuring people's math skills while they're in school, and a dimension of social skills. What you see is if you just look at people who are good at math, their wages went up a little bit more than people who had lower math skills. But the people who really are doing well in the economy now are the people who have the combination of social skills and math skills, which I think kind of speaks to the idea that, that has come up that in an economy with rapidly changing technology, being trained to do one particular thing that might get automated away or outsourced or you know, you know, global competition, et cetera, is a, can be a risky strategy. Whereas if you have the set of skills that are a little bit more versatile and are gonna be harder to replace by machines, in particular social skills, there's a path potentially to, to having higher wages. So I, I think that's also an important piece of evidence to keep in mind. Pam, we're gonna jump in. You know, there, there's one thing that I, I love what you said. <laughs> there, there's one thing that I hear all the time when you're in the community college circle is that when students are lifted into selectives or into prestigious internships, that are, I will not accept unpaid internships, so all of our internships are paid, is, it's an equity issue. It's an equity issue. So, so there is always the sense that somebody is doing our students a favor, that somehow they're lifting them out of some lower level living and lower expectations and that we're doing these students a favor. And I always go back to the work of um, Dr. Tara Yasso. Uh, I think she's at UC Riverside now, where she talks about cultural capital and, and, and cultural wealth. If you look at the gateway communities that we serve and the inner city Boston that we serve, every single student, almost, I would say 80% of our students, are either bilingual, multilingual, or they are emerging multilingual and bilingual. When you're looking at corporations and institutions who are saying we want to diversify our workforce because we think that um, diversity is going to bring us some ROI that's going to lift us into a different level of education. If that's the case, why do folks think that they're rescuing our students rather than our students providing the cultural wealth and the cultural capital and their lived experiences to a company? Again, the, the, the idea that 50% that of our undergraduates um, in the community colleges um, is only going to um, be charity cases is an old idea that's got to die. And, and I think it's a matter of understanding that it is not acculturation. Acculturation was my path when I came to the States in the 70s, I learned English within six months because I knew I had to survive and my parents told me I had to, I didn't have a choice. You learn math, you learn English. And you become a doctor, but I became a doctor that doesn't help people apparently. <laughs> so, so, so I think those kinds of expectations are again being pushed at our low income students. And it's a different kind of an immigrant story, right? They're immigrants in their own country. And, and we believe that we're, that, that we're raising them. And unless we recognize the cultural wealth of our students and, and what they will mean for the corporations of America, we're not gonna get to that cultural equity piece. The cultural lenses right now, they're all either nearsighted or farsighted. We're not hitting the right 2020. I don't know what to do about it, but maybe you do. I'm not sure that the selective colleges I prefer to call them elite myself, um, are going to be uh, the engine that's going to uh, drive either the economy or uh, diversity. That it's going to be the great, and frankly, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, I mean, if you look, Berkeley, um, UCLA, we have a set of great public schools that are, are somewhat more diverse, uh, uh, depending on uh, where, they're, where they're located. So, 
uh, so that we have to focus on the fact that most of the students in this country are not 18 years old when they start college. They're, they're older, they're adults. It's that continual learning. I have a cousin, I grew up in a working class uh, family, who started college, got straight A's, came to me, I was paying for his college because his father had passed, and said he really wanted to be an electrician and he had a cousin that could get him into an apprenticeship. He went into the apprenticeship, he ended up as the chief electrician for the Cleveland Clinic. I mean, this, he was the top of his class in the apprenticeship program. Then he decided he wanted to teach pre-electrical stuff, so he went back and finished college. He just graduated from college. I mean, he combined the two, so we need a higher education that allows people that flexibility, allows them to work and finish their degrees, as tough it is, as it is, and, and frankly, we need to focus as much on the B students mm -hmm. as the A students. I found B students to be much hungrier, and they may be getting Bs because they're working and going to school. Um, and and we, have to, we have to find a way to understand what kind of economy we want, and the talent does not end up with straight A's. So I, I want to ask, um, I feel like we've been having two levels of a conversation here. So there are some very promising initiatives sort of at the local level in specific programs and specific institutions where we're seeing positive signs. But then Tony has also been coming at it from the perspective of the system as a whole, think about trends and inequality in the US and so forth and, and where that's headed. And so to connect those pieces, I wonder if you all would comment on what you see as the role of federal policy changes in trying to get us on a better path. So there are things, as we've been hearing, that we can do in each of our inst individual institutions that can make a difference, and I hope some of those lessons will be valuable uh, for those here. But at the end of the day, we're also part of this ecosystem that's supported by federal policies that define how higher education institutions are funded, how students pay for college, and so forth. And so. Maybe I'll start with you, Tony. Uh, do you see, are there ways you can see, you know, to make systemic changes starting from federal policy that can put us on a more positive path? I think the first thing is that the federal government and state legislatures as well um, are all moving towards transparency, um, but they have yet to really pull the trigger, to use an unfortunate metaphor. Uh, the, um, in the end, we're building more and more information. That is the College Transparency Act mm -hmm. uh, is the next tranche of information that we'll have on, at the program level on uh, college going and college outcome. This system is becoming very transparent. So the real issue is, okay, now that we know all of this, uh, how are we gonna introduce it into the system? The only off the top of my head, which I'm not terribly reliable, but off the top of my head, it seems to me at some point the federal government has to, uh, they have to pass a mandate that this information is given to students the minute they sign up for a particular major or something like that. Uh, the building of a college and uh, a building of a education and career counseling system, yes, absolutely. Uh, Career counseling on, you know, it only works when it's built on personal relationships. That's the general finding of people who talk about that in my experience. So, uh, yeah, I mean, then build that, although building that is complicated. Uh, and then it seems to me that uh, in the end, the federal government, because it cannot do this in states politically, it needs to encourage the integration of high school, college, and careers. In ways that aren't tracking, obviously we can't track in K-12. We sort of threw that off, uh, off the table. We pushed that off the table with the 1983 Nation at Risk report. Ran VOCED out of town. Brought back CTE, which is sort of VOCED light. Um, so that in the K-12 system is, although people are exhausted with K-12 education reform and want nothing to do with it. Note in the last few presidential campaigns how much people talked about K-12 reform. Note the Obama administration passed it back to the states. 
Uh, so George Bush was the last guy that pushed NCLB. So, you know, I think the, uh, and not to, didn't do much good. So, you know, I do think that in the end, um, uh, we're talking about a fairly substantial public role here with respect to public institutions. I think going after selective privates, I mean, you can do it for revenge, which is what a lot of people want to do. I think that's silly. Uh, if you want to pay 80 grand to wear the right T-shirt, that's your problem. So I think the real focus of reform is in the public system. I don't, uh, and I do see that coming. I think it's somewhat inevitable. I don't, uh, I'm not pessimistic about the solution or our progress toward it. Uh, I think we'll get there. In fact, I think we'll get there Fair, in legislated time, which is decades, uh, I think we'll get there fairly soon. All right, it's a note of optimism from Tony. Um, <laughs> Donna, others you wanna? You know, I'm in, yeah. I mean, no one's opposed to transparency. I mean, you, you're not supposed to be opposed to transparency. The unintended consequences are huge. The 18 year old that's given that information, which is parents grab and says, you got to major in computer science or in engineering when what we're saying to the parents is they're going to change their majors over uh, the next four years and be ready for the fact that you thought you were getting a doctor and uh, uh, you might be getting a classics professor because they're going to find something they're passionate about. And uh, we want them to be able to pursue that, and you ought to, too. So I worry about the unintended consequences about steering students when they're early in their careers uh, with that information. But I'm not worried about the kids. I'm worried about their parents <laughs> and the people around them that are going to push them in to worrying about their first job as opposed to using higher education to find something you're passionate about. As far as uh, public policy, I agree with that. Listen, I sat in the Education and Labor Committee and listened to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle basically being anti-higher education. They weren't only willing to destroy the public education system, they were anti-higher education. They wanted to put everybody into training programs so they got their first job. So um, I hope that Congress resists enough of this, but more importantly, I hope higher education keeps explaining to parents and to the country that there's a bigger world out there. So I think that student debt is one of the most important things that we need to address in this country. The idea that we say to young people that this is the best mobility engine to get from poverty to the middle class, now pay us these extraordinary price tags, I just think is counter to everything that this country stands for. So that would be the one that I would say. And then the second is um, for the federal government to push transparency in college ratings and that more and more transparency around the number of Pell eligible students that are accepted at universities and that college ratings not just be a function of exclusivity and who is rejected, the number that the small acceptance rates, but who is really doing the most to push the needle in this country for opportunity by accepting those students from the communities that we're all talking about today. Right. I, I absolutely agree with uh, federal state policies being good levers. And, and there are levers that have been identified, right? Student debt is one of them. And uh, in fact, community college has the opposite problem. The, the, the debt per student is actually quite low. Our issue sometimes is that students are so afraid of taking up debt that they don't take the classes that they need to take, or they take them in very small increments. So it's not having you know thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, the average debt at my college is like, $4,000. That's a trip for someone to the, to the store, right? So, so, so I think student debt is a lever. I think the other lever um, is about transfer. I have had public co college and university colleagues tell me that their English 101 is really different from mine. Really? 
five, five paragraph essays and, and, and knowing how to do a research paper and knowing how to critical think does not differ yeah. from here to California, right? It, it, we know what we teach in English 101, yet they will strip the students of those credits when they transfer. And I think one of the best state policies that I've seen is in California where they mandated that if you have an associate degree at a community college, you must be accepted as a junior in your field of study, not into some general thing, and you must, become, you must be given junior status. And when you look at the rate of difference of student success, there is none. English 101 is English 101. Yet somehow, I think our values and meritocracy, idea of meritocracy, even within the public system, is making second and third class citizens of our students. So I think policies not only in funding, but also in um, student attainment is really important. Now, I, I do believe that we, we need to have short term workforce. So as educators and as policy leaders, we need to sort of work with a telescope, right? That we can telescope into programming issues, transparency issues, and the day to day operational issues that affects our students. Yet we need to be able to telescope out, right? And understanding the larger root causes of how values differ that creates implicit and explicit biases in the educational system that, that's our pu public backbone. So I'm, I'm, I'm now struggling with, um, very close to home, that we have a large number of dollars going into the public system of Massachusetts. I hope the secretary is not in attendance today. <laughs> that out of that pot of money, UMass, the UMass system gets 50% of the funding. Community colleges get 25% and the state universities gets 25% more than 50% of all of the students are in the 25% systems. Research is expensive. Wrap around services and support services to make our gateway city students or immigrant students and first generation students succeed is even more expensive. So federal and state funding parity has got to come into place. And that if we're going to be truly in an articulated system between not K-12 but K-16, and beyond, we have to figure out the funding as a system and policies as a system and not have them be disjointed. Um, so I agree with Tony. It is transparency, but it's also articulation and joining, right, and changing the narrative. I would, Raj, I would also uh, stop giving Pell Grants to proprietary institutions that um, <laughs> these for-profit institutions that rip off students and give them student debt. I can't tell you how many students I've run into that, and I thought you were going to say this, Pam, this is for you. I would triple the Pell Grants and run them through the summer so students could go all year round. Dr. Shalala for president. Yes. <laughs> These are all great concrete ideas. And just to pick up on one of them, the theme of transparency, one of the heartening trends that I've seen is a shift in the rankings that are very popular, things like US News and World Report, other classifications that are used, like the Carnegie classifications, where people are starting to put some weight on these economic mobility statistics that our team and others have been, have been constructing. And we're starting to do more work with the federal government to systematically measure mobility and be able to update these rankings over time. So I'm starting to see signs of shift in exactly these directions, which is uh, very encouraging. So that uh, brings us uh, more or less to the end of the, the time we have. I hope this has been as interesting for you as it has been uh, for me. It's been fun. I think what I've learned, just to summarize at a very broad level, is we're at a, at a point in the U.S. where we face incredible challenges in terms of the role of higher education in promoting equity and, and mobility, but there are also things that we can do at the institutional level, at the state level, at the federal level that can really make a difference going forward. So let me conclude by thanking our terrific participants, Tony, Leslie, Pam, Donna.